you would please stand in honor of God's word. <clears throat> We're going to start at verse 7. And unto the angel in the church of Philadelphia write, These things saith he that is holy, he that is true or genuine, he that hath the key of David, he that openeth and no man shutteth, and shutteth and no man openeth. I know thy works. Behold, I have set before thee an open door. No man can shut it. For thou hast a little strength, and hast kept my word, and hast not denied my name. Behold, I will make them of the synagogue of Satan, which say they are Jews and are not, but do lie. Behold, I will make them to come and to worship before thy feet, and to know that I have loved thee. Because thou hast kept the word of my patience, I will also keep thee from the hour of temptation, which shall come upon all the world to try them that dwell upon the earth. Behold, I come quickly. Hold fast that which thou hast, and no man take thy crown. He that overcometh will I make a pillar in the temple of my God, and he shall uh, go no more out, and I will write upon him the name of my God and the name of the my city of my God, which is New Jerusalem, which cometh down out of heaven from God, and I will write upon him my new name. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says unto the churches. Would you bow with me for a word of prayer? God, thank you so much for this evening. I thank you for all the activities that are going on on this campus. God, we do pray that you will be with our directors that are working with our children. God, we thank you for the fantastic program for major praise that they put on for us. I, I thank you for those kiddos that are working in Bible drill and those that are in RAs and GAs and mission friends. God, be with those that are taking care of our babies in the nursery. Uh, be with uh, Billy and Nathan as they are directing our choir, preparing for worship on Sunday. I pray you'll be with Andrew and Heather and uh, Travis and Macy as they're working with our youth and uh, God, thank you for our security team, and God, just uh, everybody who is meeting tonight, may you be honored and glorified. We love you so much. Give us understanding of your word, and we'll give you glory, for it's in Christ's name I pray. Amen. You may be seated. So we've already taken a quick look at the church at uh, Philadelphia. We know Philadelphia means the city of brotherly love, uh, and... Um, I want to take a closer look, though, at, at three words tonight that just really seem to jump off the page at me before we get to the church at Laodicea and kind of give you a recap of what I believe and why I believe it. Uh, the first word is the open door. Uh, so when you look at verse 7, and the Bible says, He that hath the key of David, he that openeth and no man shutteth, and shutteth and no man openeth, I know thy works, behold, I have set before thee an open door. So the implication in verse 7 is that there's a door that's open and no man can shut, and that when he shuts it, no one can open it. And Jesus has the key that opens and shuts the door, so he's the one responsible. Uh, I know thy works, behold, I have set before thee an open door, and no man can shut it. For thou hast a little strength, and hast kept my word, and has not denied my name. So this sounds like somebody that's just at the end of the rope, but they've still held on. They, they believed in the Word of God. They have not denied the precious name of Jesus Christ in spite of all the things that have been happening. I think, personally, that this open door is the door to heaven that Jesus will open up at the rapture. Uh, if the rapture, like our theories, and you all remember our theory is that... Uh, the rapture occurs after the opening of the sixth seal. After the moon turns uh, blood red, the sun goes black, and all the events that take place there, that the rapture occurs after the sixth seal has been opened. And again, we have the theory that each of these seals could correspond to uh, the years that, that go through, seal one, year one, seal two, year two, and they correspond with the churches. So you have the first church of Ephesus would be with the first seal, and it would be in the first year, which would mean that the sixth church, Philadelphia, would deal with the sixth seal, which would be in the sixth year. And if that's true, then uh, Jesus will open the door of heaven for his bride in the sixth year. And if we're alive and, and at that time, then we hope it's at the first of the sixth year and not at the end of the sixth year. 
Uh, listen to Revelation 6, verse 12. And I beheld when he opened the sixth seal, and lo, there was a great earthquake, and the sun became black as sackcloth of hair, and the moon became as blood. The stars of heaven fell on the earth, even as a fig tree casteth her untimely figs when she is shaken of a mighty wind. And the heaven departed as a scroll when it is rolled together. In other words, what it's saying is it's like you've got heaven and suddenly it opens like a scroll rolling back. There's a, a doorway, a portal, whatever you want to call it, an opening in heaven that is rolled back like a scroll is rolled back. So uh, I think it's uh, giving us a picture of a giant door opening up for the saints to go through to heaven. Now, here's the thing. At the conclusion of the Olivet Discourse, Jesus gives several parables that illustrate his return. So y'all know, okay, and y'all been with me. Y'all know this stuff. Matthew chapter 24, the disciples come to Jesus and say, what are the signs of your coming? And he gives what is called the Olivet Discourse, Okay. These are the signs you need to look for. You need to look for uh, deception. You need to look for false prophets. There will be wars and rumors of war. There's going to be famine, pestilence. There's going to be earthquakes. And he gives the things that we should be looking for prior to his return. Amen? Okay. So at the end of this, Matthew 24, 29, he says, Immediately after the tribulation of those days shall the sun be darkened. And the moon shall not give her light, the stars shall fall from heaven, and the powers of heaven shall be shaken. That's what it's describing in the sixth seal being opened up in Revelation 6. And then shall appear the sign of the Son of Man in heaven. Then shall all the tribes of the earth mourn, and they shall see the Son of Man coming in the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. So that's the same thing that's described in the sixth seal. The great men, the rich men, the poor men, the free men, the bond men, all hide themselves in caves and say, hide us from the face of him that sitteth on the throne, for the great day of his wrath is come, and who is able to stand? So they're seeing Jesus on his throne in heaven as the skies rolled back, and there's a great portal or a doorway opened up to heaven. And he shall send his angels with the sound of a great trumpet. They shall gather his elect from the four winds from one end of heaven to the other. That's at the end of the Olivet Discourse, Matthew 24. Got it? Then he will say, as it was in the days of Noah, so shall it be in the last days. Then, in Matthew 24, 40, then shall two be in the field, the one shall be taken, the other left. Two women shall be grinding at the mill, the one shall be taken, the other left. Watch you therefore, for you know not what hour your Lord doth come. I don't think it takes a brain surgeon to figure that thing out. You stand next to a lost person, you get yanked out of here, and he's left behind. Then in Matthew 25, verses 1 through 12, Jesus will give the parable of the ten virgins. So listen to this parable. Then shall the kingdom of heaven be likened unto ten virgins, which took their lamps and went forth to meet the bridegroom. Five of them were wise, five were foolish. They that were foolish had took their lamps and took no oil with them. But the wise took oil in their vessels with their lamps. While the bridegroom tarried, they all slumbered and slept. At midnight there was a cry made, Behold, the bridegroom cometh, go ye out to meet him. Then all those virgins arose, and they trimmed their lamps. The foolish said to the wise, Give us of your oil, for our lamps are gone out. In other words, we're not ready. We're not prepared. But the wise answered, saying, Not so, lest there be not enough for us and you. But go ye rather to them that sell and buy for yourselves. And while they went to buy, the bridegroom came, and they that were ready went in with him to the marriage, and the door was shut. Interesting, huh? Afterward also came the other virgins, saying, Lord, Lord, open to us. Open the door. The door is closed. And he answered and said, Verily I say unto you, I know you not. 
I know you're not. Shortly after this, he will say that there was a house that was built on sand and one built on the rock. And uh, they two existed together. Then the storm came and uh, the wind blew and the rain fell. And the house that built on sand crumbled and fell apart. But the house that was built on the rock stayed firm. So when you look at the parable of the virgins, it says five were wise, they were ready, and they went in the door. The five foolish virgins, the door was shut. Now, I'm not the judge. Y'all know that, right? I don't have any litmus paper I can stick on your tongue and say, that guy's saved, that woman's not saved. I don't do that. I can't do that. But the Bible does say, you shall know them by their fruits. Matthew chapter 13, Jesus gave the parable of the wheat and the tares, and he said the devil would sow tares, weeds among the wheat, and they would be separated in the last days. So what would you say about the current status of the church in the United States? About all those that claim, yes, we are Christians. When we die, we're going to go to heaven. What would you say concerning looking at their fruits. On any given Sunday, over half the membership of Southern Baptist churches never show up for worship service. There are people on our roll, if you said, Brother Sam, who is that person? I'd say, I do not know. If they've been here in 28 years, I don't know who they are. Never met them before. Over half of professing Christians never participate in any ministry of the church. They do nothing. They don't go on mission trips. They don't stand at the door and greet. They don't pass out bulletins. They're not part of the prayer ministry. They don't show up on day of prayer. They're not involved in any ministry. The grief ministry, the cooking ministry, the children's ministry, the student ministry, the music ministry. They're not involved in nothing. Over half of the membership of the church never, ever tithe. Over half never share their testimony. And not only have they not won another person to Jesus Christ, they've not even tried. And that's the Great Commission. That's our mandate. The only reason when we got saved, Jesus didn't yank us up to heaven is because we've got a task, and that's to share our testimony and to win other people to Christ. Over half never attend Sunday school or any Bible study class. Five wise prepared for the coming of the bridegroom. Five foolish proclaiming we want him to come. We, we, we want to go through the door, but they didn't make it through the door. Jesus said, I've got the keys, and when I open the door, nobody on earth can shut it. In other words, nobody can stop you from being raptured if you're a child of the living God. But if you're not prepared, once I shut the door, too sad, too bad. Not going to get through the door. The second thing that jumps out at me is the hour of temptation. Listen to this, verse 10. Because thou hast kept the word of my patience, I will also keep thee from the hour of temptation, which shall come upon all the world to try them that dwell upon the earth. Behold, I come quickly. Hold that fast which thou hast, that no man take thy crown. The hour of temptation, that's an interesting phrase. It also seems, see, when you see the word hour in the New Testament, sometimes it's saying the ninth hour, talking about a 60-minute period of time. But there are times Jesus would say, my hour has come. It's not talking about 60 minutes. It's taking, talking about this period of time has come. So in Revelation 14, verse 6, the Bible says, And I saw another angel in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel to preach unto them that dwell on the earth, the every nation, the kindred, and tongue, and people, saying with a loud voice, Fear God and give glory to him for the hour... The hour of his judgment is come. Worship him that made heaven and earth and the sea and the fountains of the waters. 
This refers not to a 60-minute period of time. It's referring to a period of time where the judgment of God falls. Now, the question is, why are we raptured? Why is God going to rapture the church? Those born-again believers who have been uh, spiritually saved, wh why is he going to rapture us out? What? Because he doesn't want us to suffer persecution? No. The Bible says if you serve Jesus, you're going to endure persecution. He didn't want us to have any tribulation. No, the Bible says you're going to know tribulation. To the best of our knowledge, 10 of the 12 original apostles were martyred. They gave their life. How, how can we go there and go, well, we're not supposed to suffer. No, I don't want to get hurt. I don't want to skin my knee. How, how, how can we say that? But... The reason for the rapture is because God has promised the children of God that you will not suffer the wrath of God. So the question you've got to ask is, where does the wrath of God begin? Once Daniel's 70th week starts, where does it begin? Is it those first six seals? Is that the wrath of God? Well, if it is, then suddenly you've got to go back to the fifth seal where it's the martyrdom of Christians, and you're saying that's the wrath of God. That those who've given their heart to Christ are going to suffer God's wrath and he's going to kill them. But they're crying, Lord, how, how long, O holy and true God, until you avenge our blood? And he says, just a little while. I, 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 it's coming. It's not here yet. It's coming. The third thing that would jump off the page is the temple of my God. Revelation 312, him that overcometh, I will make a pillar in the temple of my God, and he shall go no more out. I will write upon him the name of my God and the name of my city of my God, which is the new Jerusalem, which cometh down out of heaven from my God, and I will write upon him my new name. The opening of the sixth seal, the sun goes black, moon turns blood red, the stars are shaken, cosmic disturbances, the skies roll back like a scroll. Revelation 6, 15, the kings of the earth, the great men, the rich men, the chief captains, the mighty men, every bondman, every free man hid themselves in the dens and the rocks and said to the mountains and the rocks, fall on us and hide us from the face of him that sitteth on the throne for the, and, and from the wrath of the lamb for the great day of his wrath is come and who should be able to stand? And after these things, I saw four angels stand at the four corners of the earth, holding the four winds of the earth, that the wind should not blow on the earth, nor on the sea, nor on any tree. Got it? That's the opening of the sixth seal in Revelation 6. Now listen to the end of the Olivet Discourse. Immediately after the tribulation of those days, the sun shall be darkened. And the moon shall not give her light. The stars will fall from heaven. The powers of heaven shall be shaken. Sounds kind of familiar, doesn't it? And then shall appear the sign of the Son of Man in heaven. Well, that's what everybody was seeing. We see him. And then shall all the tribes of the earth mourn. They shall see the Son of Man coming in the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. That's why they're hiding themselves in the caves and in the mountains. Because they see Jesus. And he will send his angels with a great sound of a trumpet. And they shall gather together as elect from the four winds... And from one end of heaven to the other. Same terminology that's used in Revelation 6 and Revelation 7, 1. Then in chapter 7, Revelation 7, immediately after those four angels which have held back the four winds and have done their business, the Bible says that 12,000 of each of the 12 tribes of Israel are going to be sealed with the seal of God, which basically says they now have become the people of God. 144,000. It is not the Jehovah Witnesses. That's who they... <laughs> These are descendants of the tribes of Israel. Now, how they're identified, I don't know. Not sure. Maybe DNA can do that one day. But they will be identified, and there'll be, I, I think, multiples of that. I think that's a multiple number, but it could be 12,000 on the dot from each of those 12 tribes. But they're going to be sealed. In other words, a, as he told the church at Philadelphia, he said, those who call themselves Jews that are not will one day come back to you and go, you were right. 
They're going to acknowledge that you were right. And I think it's the rapture that's going to turn them. So what happens after that? Well, the Bible says that suddenly an innumerable multitude of Christians suddenly shows up before God. Revelation 7, 13. One of the elders answered, saying to me, What are these that are arrayed in white robes? And whence came thee? Because the Bible says, Suddenly there's a multitude from all nations and tribes wearing white robes, saying, Hosanna to the Lord, saying, Worthy are you, O God, to receive glory and honor and power. You saved us. And, and uh, an elder goes, Hey, John, you know who these folks are? And where they came from? And he said, No, but you know. And he said to me, these are those which came out of great tribulation and have, their, have washed their robes, made them white in the blood of the Lamb. Therefore, they before the throne of God and serve him day and night in his temple. So what did Jesus promise the church at Philadelphia where these guys were going to go? Right as he says, behold, I come quickly. You're going to come and you're going to be in my temple. I think that's interesting, Okay. Now, let me summarize because i got to quit. If you know me, you know I really, 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 really hope and pray for a pre-tribulation rapture. That at any moment, Christ could appear in the sky and take me to heaven. And I'm ready. I'm prepared. But I'm, also, but I'm convinced through studying the Word of God over the past 40 years that the church will go through a large portion of Daniel's 70th week. And that there will be a great falling away from the faith. Because Paul said, prior to the day of the Lord, when we're meeting Jesus in the air, there will be a great falling away. And you will see the Antichrist declare himself to be God. And, and that the false prophet will say, everybody that is to worship the beast will take a mark of the beast. And if you don't take the mark, you can't buy or sell. Daniel 7, twice the Bible indicates the Antichrist will make war with the saints and will wear them out. Read it, Daniel 7. Revelation 13, 7 mirrors that same thought that the beast will make war with the saints and overcome them. So what would I say? Well, I, I think now is the time to make sure you're secure in your faith in Jesus Christ. Amen. That you truly know him. That you're not a foolish virgin versus a wise virgin. That you're truly anticipating whether it's a pre-tribulation or post-tribulation or mid-tribulation or coming to first seal, second seal, third seal, fourth seal, fifth seal, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve seal. That you are ready. That you're serving him with everything you've got. That until the day pulls us out of here, we're still hard charging. We're trying to call one more person to repentance. One more person to faith in Christ. And that we're holding fast to what we have. Because if the Bible reads like I think it reads, it's going to get tough. Tough. And we've been living in a bubble in East Texas. But if he makes war against us, it's going to get tough. 